Okay, so we're going to continue looking at section 6.1, um, which is on angles. Okay, the first part, um, we talked about what angles were, and the big thing was how we changed between degrees and radians. Okay, first thing we're going to look at in this section is what's called arc length. Okay, arc length is basically when you draw part of a circle okay, between two points on the circumference, say there and there, and if we connect them, we have an arc. Okay, so the goal today is going to be how do we find the length of an arc. Usually they'll give us two pieces of information. You've got to know how big of a circle this is, and you have to know the angle that I just drew. Okay, say that's the angle. Okay, given those two things, the size of the angle and the size of the circle, you could find the length of the arc. Okay, one important thing we have to use is this fact. Okay, the size of an arc and the size of the angle are directly proportional. Okay, so what that means, if you double the size of the arc, that would double the size of the angle. If you take half the size of the angle, that would be half the size of the arc. All right, so they are directly proportional. Right, any questions on that? So if I had an angle um, that was 90 degrees, okay, and I measured the arc, and then I had an angle that was 180, and I measured the arc, how would those two measurements compare? The one would be double, given that they're on the same size circle. Okay. An angle that's 180 would have double the size of an arc as an angle that's 90 on the same size circle. Okay. All right, so let's start off with, with that diagram. Okay, so in this circle, I have two central angles. Okay, I'm calling one of my angles theta and the other angle theta 1. Okay, and each one of these angles corresponds to an arc that I've drawn in red. Okay. Arc S is formed by angle theta, and arc S1 is formed by the rays of theta 1. Okay, and R stands for the radius. All right, we're going to do something that we've, um, we've done before. Okay, we have to come up with kind of a, what we call a starting fact. Okay. For example, I think I did this one a couple days ago. One foot equals 12 inches. If you use that as kind of your starting point, you can convert any number of feet to inches that you want. So if you set it up like this, and I said to you, um, I don't know how many inches in 7.6 feet. Just put 7.6 feet in the top, x in the bottom and solve your proportion. Okay, so what we're looking for is this starting fact. Okay? But it's not going to be a connection between feet and inches. It's going to be a connection between angle size and arc size. All right? That's what we need. So there's some, there is a connection there. All right. So to give you a hint, Let's suppose we let theta 1 equal 1 radian. Okay, why did I pick 1? Um, same reason I picked 1 when I wrote the conversion. 1's an easy number to work with. I could also do 2. In 2 feet, there's 24 inches. <coughs> but now my fraction's a little bigger. Okay, so I'm using 1 just because 1's an easy number to work with. If we made theta 1 equal to 1 radian, does anybody remember what that means about this arc? If this angle is one radian, it has something in common with something else if you measure its length. Aiden? The arc length is equal to the radius length. Right, and there, that's our connection. If this angle is one, then this arc is equal to the radius. Then S1 equals R. That's going to be our starting point. And using basically that fact, we can set up a proportion. All right, so our proportion, we could set it up as theta over s equals theta 1 over s1. Now, there's a bunch of ways you can set the proportion up, just as long as you're consistent. Okay, this angle to this arc, this angle to this arc. 
Um, basically, you can set it up any way as long as theta and S1 are on a diagonal and theta1 and S are on a diagonal. Okay, as long as that happens, your proportion's fine. All right, now we're going to fill in what we know. All right. So we don't know theta and we don't know S. So I'm just going to leave those. But theta1, we're going to fill in 1. And S1, what am I filling in for that? R. So right there, what I just circled is basically like that. It's my starting point. And I can use that starting point to figure out anything I want. I just needed a starting point. Now I have it. Okay. Any questions on that? All right. Now, that's basically your formula, but we're going to clean it up a little bit and get rid of the fractions. Um, so how do, we, how do we solve a proportion? Yep. Cross multiplication. Yeah. We're going to cross multiply. So I have s times 1. Just write that as s. And then we have r times theta. Okay, we get s equals r theta. And that is our formula for the length of an arc. <coughs> right, so s is your arc. r is your radius. And theta is your angle. But we've got to be careful with the angle. What did we assume way back at the beginning of this problem? That theta 1 was what? 1 radian. Right, so way back at the beginning, we assumed we're, going, we're working in radians. So this formula only works if your angle is in radians. So if you get an angle in degrees, you need to convert it. Hey, questions on this formula? All right. So the idea here, they can give you two out of three things. Okay. Maybe they'll give you r and theta, you find s. Or they'll give you s and r, and you find theta. Or they could give you s and theta, and you find r. But you'll always know two out of three of the things. All right. So this problem says find the length of an arc. Okay. So we know what we're solving for. If you have a circle with a radius of 2, and the central angle is pi over 4, What's my units on this? Exactly, radians. Hey, so we want to find that arc. I drew it. It's a little hard to see, but I drew it in red. Right there. All right, so first thing we should do, just write down the formula we've got to use, and then we'll plug in. Um, Sean, what, what's the formula to find the length of an arc? S equals r theta. Yep. S equals r theta. Okay, and Bill, in this problem, what's my radius? Uh, two inches. Radius is two inches. And Nick, um, what's my angle? Pi over four radians. Pi over four radians. Do I need to convert it? No. No, it's already radians. We just leave it as radians. Right, so we just multiply that out. We get pi over two. Pi over uh, yep, so we get 2 pi over 4, which is pi over 2. Now, I'm fine with leaving the answer in radians, but if they ask for degrees, what's pi over 2 radians in degrees? 90 degrees. That's 90 degrees. Okay. Now, oh, I'm sorry, this is an arc length. So, what, so it's, it's not an angle. Um, it's 3.14 divided by 2. So it's about 1.57, and what should be my label on it? inches, because okay. we found the length of an arc. Okay. So always make sure you double check. Did you find an angle, or did you find an arc? We found S, which is an arc. Right. So if they wanted it as a decimal, you could type in 3.14, divide by 2, get 1.57. Right. Any questions on that one? All right. Let's look at this one. This one says find the radius of a circle if the arc length is 3 pi feet and the central angle is 60 degrees. All right, so, Leon, what's, um, what's the formula I'm going to use here? 
You don't have to plug into it, just the, just the basic formula. Right. Um, S equals R theta. Good. Okay, and Matt, what am I solving for this time? Radius. I'm solving for radius. So they need to give me the other two things. Okay. Uh, Jacob, what's one thing they give me? Uh, they give you the arc length. Yep, and what is my arc length? 3 pi. 3 pi. Okay, are we? We don't know. And what about theta? What would I fill in for that? Yep. Yeah, I'm going to have to fill in pi over 3. Okay, why don't I just put 60? Yeah, it needs to be in radians. Okay. Any question on how you convert 60 degrees to radians? Okay with that? All right. If you can start to convert the multiples of 30 in your head, um, that, that is helpful. All right. So now, question on that? No? OK. Um, now we want to get r by itself. So how do we get rid of the pi and the 3 at the same time? Yep. Multiply by the reciprocal. Which would be? Pi over pi. Yeah, multiply each side by 3 over pi. Okay, 3 over pi. Okay, that, those are both gone. And those are gone. So what is my radius here? 9. 9 feet. Okay, so we just go back and look at the units for length in this problem, units of length are in feet. Okay, so any questions on that? All right, so we did an example where they gave you s and theta. We did r and theta. We didn't do an example where they gave you s and r. But any questions on how you do that? You just plug in for s, you'd plug in for r, divide each side by r, and then you'd have your angle in radians. Okay. So just double check that that's the units they want for the final answer. If they want degrees, just, uh, just convert it. All right. Next thing we're going to look at is what's called angular velocity. Okay. Has anybody done that in physics? No? Okay, well, <laughs> we'll, um, we'll take a look at it. It's actually it's a pretty simple idea. But it's basically used to measure the speed of something moving in a circular path. Okay, and we're generally going to use radians. Okay. But there's other, other times in the real world where they use a different measure. Um, can anybody think of s some units that measure the speed of something moving in a circle? Hertz. Yeah? Hertz. Um, not hertz. We, I, we do use hertz for other things. Um, or maybe, I'm just not familiar with that. Using hertz to measure circular movement. Like the speed of something. Anybody think of um, something? Yeah? Like RPM? Yeah, RPMs. That's angular velocity. It's measuring not radians, but it's measuring rotations. And in that case, it's per minute. Okay, we can do per second, per hour. We can do degrees per minute. We can do radians per minute. Anything like that is called angular speed, okay, where you have an angle per time unit. Okay, angular speed, angular velocity. For this class, we can use those terms really interchangeably. All right, so I want you to take a look at this disk. Okay, and I've got three points on it, okay, one pretty close to the center, and then two others farther out. Okay, if I make, um, make one revolution with that, okay, and just watch kind of the movement of the points, which point moved the farthest? The yeah, the outer one. Okay. And, and the, middle, the middle one really stayed pretty stationary. It didn't move too far. All right. So everyone agrees that this point moved the farthest? It had the biggest distance. Now, in terms of going around the circle, when do they all get back to the same point? Does, or another way to say it is, does any point get there faster than any other point? No. 
it all takes the same amount of time for all these points to get exactly back where they started. Okay, they all do it in the same amount of time, but this one travels the farthest distance. So what does that mean? It's going faster than everything else, which is now that's getting confusing. If this one's covering more distance in the same amount of time as everything else, think about your formula. Distance divided by time equals speed. If your distance is bigger and your time is the same, your rate is faster. So that means every point on this circle is traveling at a different linear speed, okay, which is confusing. All right? So that's why we use the idea of angular velocity. Every one of these points in terms of their angular velocity is traveling at the same speed. They're all making one revolution per minute, or in my case, maybe one revolution every two seconds. All right? So angular, that's why we need it. Okay, so angular speed is measured in usually radians per time unit. Okay, so if they ask you to convert something to angular speed, they want radians. It can be radians per second, radians per hour, radians per minute. Um, it can be anything. But it has to be radians. <coughs> okay, linear speed, okay, what I just talked about a second ago, that's the speed of an object moving in a straight line. Okay, so like your speedometer on your car, whether it's miles per hour or kilometers per hour, okay, feet per second, those are all examples of linear speed. Okay, and we can convert angular speed to linear speed. Um, one way you could, could think about it is if you had some kind of object attached to the end of a rope and you were swinging the rope in a circle and you let the rope go, that object would take off in a straight line. Gravity would cause it to curve down. But in general, it, it would take off straight. Well, that's an example of all of a sudden angular speed being converted to linear speed. All right? So given, say, a length of rope like a foot long um, and how many revolutions per minute you're swinging it at, I could tell you if you let it go how fast it would hit, say, the wall. You know, would it hit at 20 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour. All right? So that's, that's the idea of in between converting angular to linear speed. Right? And we'll do that um, numerically. We'll practice that. Okay, and the easiest way to do it is really focusing on our units and using dimensional analysis. Okay, how many people have done that before? Dimensional analysis. A few people? Yeah. Okay. Right, as long as we as long as we can um, Understand the idea that if you have units in the top of a fraction and units in the bottom, just like degrees and degrees, they cancel. And we have to know our conversions. Okay, so some conversions I, I'd expect you to know, like feet to inches, you know, minutes to hours, minutes to seconds, things like that. Okay, but if it was an awkward conversion, um, I, I would give you that one. Okay, so let's just practice not converting a, a rate, but just a very basic number, okay? just days to minutes. Let's start out with three days. Okay? And usually when we convert, we convert one, kind of one step at a time. So we go from days, what's the next unit? Hours. Hours, okay? getting smaller. Okay? What's the conversion between days and hours? All right, so 24 hours equals one day. So now our choice here, it's either 1 over 24 or 24 over 1. Yeah, you want days or day in the bottom, and you want hours in the top. If you put days in the bottom, it cancels out days in the top. So 24 hours, one day. Okay, now what's the next unit? down from an hour? Minutes. Minutes. OK, so in one hour, how many minutes? 60. 60. Okay. So now we have a choice. It's either 1 over 60 
or 60 over 1. But where do we want hours? Bottom. bottom. You put hours in the bottom, it'll cancel hours in the top. So one hour, 60 minutes. Okay, and when you're done, your unit that you haven't crossed out, that's the unit of your final answer. Okay, so you get three times 24 times 60. Right, so 4,320 minutes. Questions on that? Okay, so that's just, that's not a rate. That's just a single number. We're just converting units. Okay, now let's try a, a rate. So now we have two things we have to convert. We've got to convert feet to miles, and we've got to convert seconds to hours. All right, so let's just start by writing that as a fraction. We're traveling 50 feet every second. All right, so do we want to try to get feet to miles first or seconds to hours? Let's go with seconds. Seconds to hours? Yeah. All right. So we've got to multiply by a fraction where, and where is seconds going to go? Top. Top. Okay, so the conversion between seconds and, we're going to go to minutes first, 60 seconds in one minute. So where does the 60 go? It goes with the seconds. In 60 seconds, there's one minute. Okay, so all you do all the way down is use conversions. All right, now if we did this problem out, we'd have a speed in feet per minute. Okay, want to keep going? What would be my next step? 60 minutes per hour. All right, we're going to convert minutes to hours. What's the conversion there? 60 per one. 60 minutes per one hour. Okay, now we have a speed in feet per hour. So we have the time unit. Now we need the distance unit. Okay, where's feet going to go here? Bottom. Bottom. And then in the top, I'm going to go right to miles. Okay, what's the conversion between miles and feet? 5,280. And where's that go? Bottom. Bottom. Good. 5,280 feet in one mile. Okay, now, okay, now what do we do? You multiply. Yeah, just multiply sh straight across. So we have 50 times 60. Okay, times 60. And now what I do is I would just divide by every denominator I have one at a time. Okay, so I divide by the one. It equals, divide by 1, divide by 1, and then divide by 5,280. Okay, so that's a speed of about 34.09. And what's my units? Miles per hour. Miles per hour. Okay, so 50 feet per second is about 34.09 miles per hour. Okay, questions on that one? All right, so now let's... Try an angular speed. Okay, 200 radians per second to revolutions per minute. Okay. What's the um, first thing I could do? Okay, we can deal with the seconds and get that to minutes. So what's my conversion for that? 60 seconds per minute. 60 seconds in one minute. Right, so now we have the, the time unit we want. Now we've got to get radians to revolutions. Okay, even if you don't know the conversion, where does RAD have to go? Uh, Bottom. Okay, again, I'm writing it so you can see it. Makes the dimensional analysis easier. So radians to revolutions. What's the conversion between radians and revolutions? Is it a pi? Uh, it has pi in it, yeah. Two pi. Two pi radians in how many revolutions? One. One. Okay. One revolution is 360 degrees or two pi radians. All right, so now just multiply out 
200 times 60, we get 1,200, or 12,000, divided by 2, and then I can divide by pi. Okay, just on this calculator, it's easier for me to type it in. So that's 1,909.9. And what are my units? Revolutions per minute. Hey. Any question on that one? All right. So now let's look at a conversion that's going to involve jumping from an angular speed to a linear speed. Okay. So this one says a wheel with a radius of 18 inches okay, is rotating at 1850 RPMs, okay, revolutions per minute. First, I want the angular speed of the wheel in radians per second. Okay, so first thing is we're just doing a conversion like we did up above. Second thing I want is the linear speed at a point on the circumference of the wheel. All right, so basically this is like if you had a tire okay, spinning at 1850 RPM. And all of a sudden, you just put it on the ground, it didn't lose any traction, and it just took off straight. That's how the linear speed, that's how fast it would be going. All right, so let's, let's start with part A. All right, so what's the speed of my wheel right now? It's 1850, and how would I write that as a fraction? Uh, revolution is does that many revolutions in one minute. Is this, um, no, okay. Okay, how would I convert that to radians per second? Okay, so how many radians in a revolution? Two pi radians one revolution. Okay, so we've got our angular unit, radians instead of revolutions. And how do I get minutes to seconds? 60 seconds, 60 seconds on top? No, one, one minute. minute. Yeah, one minute, 60 seconds. Okay, so minutes is gone. Look at your units, radians and seconds, radians per second. That's what they want. All right, so we got 1850 times 2 pi. And then divide by 60. Anybody else get that? 193.73? Yeah. Good. And that's radians per second. Okay, now part B. Okay, this is going to be the first time we've, we've done this. We're going to jump from angular speed to linear speed. So what I'm going to do is go back to the original speed. Radians per second actually doesn't help me. Revolutions is one step closer to linear speed than radians. Okay, you'll, you'll see why in a second. 1850 revolutions per minute. Okay, and let's at least handle the time first, seconds. Okay, so to convert to seconds, we just did that earlier. One minute, 60 seconds. All right, now we've got to get revolution to feet. So where would revolution go? It would go in the bottom. And now we need a conversion between revolutions and feet. So how, how am I going to do that? Any thoughts on that? Yep. Yeah, you've got to use your formula for the circumference. If you can find the circumference of the circle, the circumference is really what? All right, so yeah, let's we can start with the formula. 2 pi r. But 
in terms of the you, what we're talking about. So the circumference is the length of one revolution. Yeah, the circumference is the length of one revolution. Okay, if you had, if you had like a um, piece of metal, metal wire wrapped in a circle, right? And you cut that wire and you laid it out straight. That's basically what we're doing right now. We're taking one revolution, which is one time around the circle, and we're going to find what that distance is and lay it out straight, make it linear. Okay. So circumference is 2 pi times 18. Right? Was that our radius or our diameter? Yeah, be, be careful if they give you diameter. That, that can trick people up. So if they give you diameter, cut it in half or use pi times d to just be careful. All right. So my circumference is 30, oops, 36 pi inches. Now, we have a choice. We can either convert revolutions to inches and then separately convert inches to feet, or we can just convert our sum circumference to feet right now. Yeah, so what would this be in feet? 3 pi feet. OK, so you just divide that by 12. And that's how you convert inches to feet. Okay, so now we have this many feet in one revolution. Yep, so there's 3 pi feet in one revolution. This conversion can change in every problem. Converting from minutes to seconds, that's the same every time. Converting miles to feet, that's always the same. Hours to days, it's always the same. But revolutions to feet or revolutions to inches depends on the size of your wheel. Okay? So this conversion can change every time. Right. So now let's make sure we get the right units. Feet per second, is that what they want? Feet per second. Okay, anybody, anybody do that out and get a... Um, I got 290.6. 290.6? Yep. That's feet per second. Okay, probably we can think that that is pretty fast. Imagine something traveling almost 300 feet every second. Um, but if we put it in miles per hour, I think that would give us an even better um, way for us to visualize how fast it's really going. Okay, but we just did one earlier. Didn't we in feet per second? 50 feet per second is about 34 miles an hour. So this object is going about six times faster than 50 feet per second. So, so it's about, I mean, it's not like it's thousands of miles an hour, but yeah, it's, it's up around a couple hundred miles an hour. So not as fast as like an airplane, but or like a jet plane, but it's pretty, pretty fast. Maybe fast as some race cars. Okay. All right. Any questions on, on that? Right, so that's the last part of section um, 6.1. Okay, let's take a look at the first part of 6.2. All right, so 6.2 okay, is on what we call unit circle trigonometry. In this class, this is going to be the first time we actually see all six trig definitions. The sine, the cosine, the tangent, the secant, the cosecant, and the cotangent. And there's really a couple main ways that you can do trigonometry. Okay, one of it is right triangle trig. Okay, if you're familiar with Sakatoa and, and all that, that's, that's right triangle trig. Okay, unit circle trig is looking at basically doing it on a circle. Specifically, a circle that's radius one. Has anybody done unit circle trig before? All right, so this will probably be new for a lot of people. Hey, let me just show you the big idea, and then I'll come back up to this diagram. Okay. First thing is, it's only for certain angles. Okay, by certain <coughs> angles, I mean angles that are multiples of thirty or 45, and there's some overlap there. Um, 
Uh, nope, it's all, we're not going to be able to do like 15 and 75 on here. But you'll be able to do 30, 60, 90, 45. Okay, that's everything in the first quadrant and, and on the axes. All right, so for certain angles, multiples of 30 and 45. Technically, you can do it with multiples of 15. But we'll get to that later on when we study uh, trig identities. All right, so the idea is that for certain angles, we can draw them in a unit circle, and then we can sketch that intercepted arc. Well, that intercepted arc has an endpoint right there. And that endpoint has coordinates. Okay, there's a certain distance you go in this case, left, and then a certain distance up. Okay, the whole goal is to find the coordinates of that endpoint. If you can, then you can do unit circle trick. Right, so those two values, the x value and the y value, allow you to find all six trigonometric functions of that angle. Okay, and you might be kind of looking at that and saying, well, if you know about trig functions, trig functions involve angles. So why can I use this arc? What does this arc have to do with this angle? Well, if you remember from the last section, what, what was our formula for, for arc length? S equals R theta. And we're on a unit circle. So what's the radius here? One. Yeah, so basically we get the length of the arc and the angle are the same thing, All right? So the length of the arc, the size of the angle, they're exactly the same thing. That's why I can use this arc and the coordinate of its endpoint because it's really the same as this angle. Okay, now if we weren't on a unit circle, this idea wouldn't work exactly the way I'm showing you. Um, it could still work. It's just not as, not as um, simple as what I'm about to show you. Okay, so any question on the, the big idea of unit circle trig? Okay, you sketch an angle, you draw an arc, you find the coordinates of where the arc ends, but we're only doing it for certain angles. All right, so the, the next thing we need is basically definitions. Okay, we need to know, once we have x and one, once we have y, what do we do with them? Okay, how do we use them? Do we divide them? Do we, what, what do we do with them? So that's what I'm going to show you next. All right, so these are our first three trig functions. Okay, on the calculator, you have buttons for all of them. Okay, sine, cosine, and tangent. Okay, abbreviated SIN for sine, COS for cosine, TAN for tangent. Okay, and on the graphing calculator, they're right above the parentheses. Okay, sine, cosine, tangent. All right, so if you have an angle that you've drawn and you want to know the sine of that angle, all you have to do is find your coordinate and write down the y value. Okay, the y value is the sine. Okay, if you draw an angle and you want to know the cosine of it, take your coordinate that you found, and it's the x value. Okay, sine and cosine are the easiest to find because all they are is the y and x. You don't have to do anything to them. All the other ones, we gotta, we got to do something with them. Okay, if you want the tangent, take y and divide by x. And the other three trig functions. You have your cosecant, your secant, and your cotangent. 
Okay, COSI can't. Um, we usually just abbreviate with the first three letters, but we can't because we already use COS for something else. So they call it COSI can't. Yes, they use the first letter of each syllable. Then we have secant and cotangent. All right, and the reason I set them up like this across from each other is these are all reciprocals. Okay, that's the relationship. What's, what is a reciprocal? What does that mean to do? Flip it. So if sine is y, or think of it as y over 1, if that's helpful, and the cosecant is the reciprocal, how would you write cosecant? <laughs> 1 over y. Okay, so once you have the sign, if you flip it, you get the cosecant. Okay, following the same pattern, um, what do you think the secant is? 1 over x. 1 over x. And cotangent? x over y. x over y. Okay, so unit circle trig is all based on finding that coordinate. Okay, which is very, very easy to do for angles that are multiples of 30 and 45. Okay, I'm not sure we're going to get to all of these angles today. Um, we'll at least try some basic ones, and maybe, maybe the 90s, multiples of 90, and we'll go from there. Okay. Just kind of on a side note, thinking about something we're going to be doing in this chapter, I wrote that tangent equals y over x. What's y based on our formulas? Sine. Y is the sine. Sine over cosine. Sine over cosine. This and this are exactly the same thing. All right? So if you were to say, um, I don't know, let's say your tangent button doesn't work. Mine, mine does right now. So I'm going to press tangent. I'm going to type 70, and I get an answer. Okay, now uh, my tangent button's broke. Aiden ripped it out. So now I'm going uh, <laughs> to type it in a different way. I'm going to type sine of 70. I'm going to hit divide by cosine 70, and I get exactly the same thing. All right? This, this idea is very important, along with 10 or 15 other ideas similar to it. Okay, these are called identities. Different ways to rewrite trig functions. Okay, for now, you don't, um, you don't have to know this idea yet. Okay, but this is where we're going to be going in this chapter. Okay. Yeah? Um, last year's geometry, we're showing for um, triangles and everything that the sign would be Opposite over hypotenuse, the cosine. Yeah, 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 and like stuff like that. Yeah, in fact, this opposite over hypotenuse, adjacent over hypotenuse, opposite over adjacent, it's exactly the same thing. It's just a different way of looking at it. Once we learn that, I'll connect this to what, what you just said. All right, so uh, quadrantal angles. Okay, those. Just a special name for angles that are multiples of 90. Wow. Okay. 0, 90, 180, 270. Yeah, quadrantal. Okay, angles that are on the axes. All right. So now how do we how do we actually evaluate a trig function for a given angle? Well, there's two steps. Okay, step one is you have to find the coordinate. Okay, remember, this is like the end point of that arc. Okay, so you get that. After you find the co coordinate that corresponds to your angle, then you plug in the x and y values to whichever formula they want. Okay, when we start, we'll do all six. We'll find a coordinate and we'll practice finding everything. Okay, on the test, they might give you something and just say, find the cosine, and that's it. Okay, I'm not going to ask you to do all six in the same problem. That would be six separate problems on the test. All right, so in this one, they're giving me the coordinate. Okay, I don't have to find it. So sometimes step one is already done for you. They're telling me, there's my coordinate. Now, from last night's homework, I think you had a problem that said, uh, Autumn asked me about zero, Five. It gave you that point. This is kind of the same idea. 
I bet everybody could figure out what this angle is, but we don't need it. Okay? We're not actually finding the angle. We're finding six trig functions of the angle. All right? And what I kind of described that or being similar to is if I met somebody on the street, I don't need their name to describe them. I can describe their hair, their eye color, how tall they are, color shoes. I can describe all of that without knowing their name. Okay? Think of these six trig functions as things that describe the angle. Okay? We can describe the angle without even knowing its name. Or by name, I mean size. Okay? We, we don't need to know its size to describe a bunch of things about it. Okay? Similar to what I just said. All right, so in this one, they gave us x and y. Let's find all six trig functions. Start off with sine. Okay, if you need to, you can go back and, and look. Um, but what's um, what's my definition for sine? So sine is y. So in this case, one. That's it. That's my sine. Co cosine is. Yep, it's my x value, which is zero. And tangent. Undefined. How'd you get that? 1 over 0, 1 over 0. Yeah. 0, that's undefined. Yeah, tangent is, I, sometimes I look at it as sine over cosine. Just divide the 2 you have right above it. 1 over 0. And we write undefined. Okay, make sure if you get 1 over 0, you do put undefined. So you know what? Let me write it like this. And now once we have the 3 on the left, what do we do with each one to get the 3 on the right? Yeah, just flip them. You just have to remember the names. What's the reciprocal of sine? Cosecant. So in this case, yeah, one, when you flip it, it stays the same. What about the secant? Yeah, think of this as zero over one. If you flip it, now it becomes one over zero. Undefined. Last one is, zero, zero. and what's the name? Cotangent. Cotangent. Flip zero over one. Um, flip it, you get zero over one, which is zero. Right. Any questions on that? Right. Um, really, the worst thing that can happen with these kind of problems is we have to deal with square roots. Okay? And the idea is simplify anything you can. Don't ever leave a square root in the denominator. Let's start with our sine. Okay, Brian? Yeah, sine and cosine, the quickest ones to find. You don't have to do any, any arithmetic at all. Cosine, 1 half. And tangent. Okay, for tangent, visually, if you just want to pretend putting a big fraction in there, and you're doing sine over cosine. What's going to cancel out when I divide these fractions? The two. Anytime you divide fractions and the denominators are the same, they cancel out. So what am I left with? Square root of three over one, or just square root of three. Okay. If you don't like that idea of I'm canceling, some people instead of dividing by a fraction, they multiply by the reciprocal. That's the same thing. The two still cancel out. All right, um, cosecant. What would be my, my first step? So what do we do with this? Flip it. Flip it. Okay. Some people said, well, isn't it one over that? Yeah, that, that's flipping it. So if you do one over this, you're going to get that. OK, that flips it. Anytime you take 1 divided by something. And now how do we fix it? So my final answer? 2 squared over 3 over 3. Perfect. 2 squared root is 3 over 3. Yeah, secant is nice because we didn't have any root, so we don't have to worry about that. And cotangent, let's just start with the first step and then fix it. 
Yep. That would be x over y. And it'll become square root 3 over 3. Okay. Any question on that one? Uh, what's what's different about this one? What do you, you do have to find something. What do you have to find? You have to find x and y. Okay. If they give you the angle, that's great, but it doesn't help. You need the coordinate. Okay. So what I would do is sketch it, make your unit circle, okay. and ninety. Um, well, remember, we're on a unit circle. So what would be the coordinates of this point? That's the origin right there. Zero, one. Zero, one. You don't go left and right. You go up one. Now you have your coordinate. Now it's just like the last problems. Okay? And we already did this one. Go back to example 1A. Okay, there's all your answers. All right, so I'm just going to write C, example 1A, for answers. Okay, so the only additional step is you found the coordinate first. Um, so A to no, you can't use any value. Yeah, because it's the arc. Yeah, it's going to either be like uh, 1, 0, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, or 0, negative 1. Yeah. Anytime you're on one of the quadrantal angles. Okay, what about um, 270? Where, where's 270? Bottom. 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 Okay, 0, 90, 180, 270. So what's my coordinate for 270? 0, negative 1. 0, negative 1. That's x, that's y. Okay, so what's my sign? Negative one. Cosine? Zero. Tangent? Undefined. Undefined. Uh, cosecant? Uh, negative one. Yep, we just found the other number that when you flip it stays the same. One when you flip it stays the same. Negative one stays the same. Um, secant? And cotangent? Zero. Zero. Good. Questions on that? Six trig fun functions of pi. Okay, what, um, if you weren't familiar with this type of notation or these units, what might you want to do first? Yeah? Yeah, you could convert it to what? Sure. And does anybody know what pi radians is? It's 180. And where is that on my circle? Yeah. The coordinates for that? Negative 1, 0. And is that the one we did? No, we did 0, 1. And 0, negative 1. All right, so we haven't done this combination of negative 1s and zeros, but you're going to see all the same types of answers. Um, just in different spots. Okay, so what's my sine? Cosine? And tangent? Zero. Zero. Cosecant? Undefined. Undefined. Negative one. Negative one. Undefined. Undefined. Okay, so when you have a 0, 90, 180, or 270, you don't get that much variety in your answers because they're all ones and zeros. So you can get positive ones, negative ones, zeros, and undefined. That's the only answers you can get. Okay. Any questions on that? Uh, I have a bunch more. Let's just do, um, let's, let's just finish up with this one. Six trig functions of seven pi over two. Okay, now this is one some people might look at and they're not sure what it is. So what what can I multiply by to convert that? Uh, 180, over 180 over pi. 
You get 7 times 180. Divide by 2 is 630. Now, that's, that's still an angle that's difficult to work with. What would be an angle that's, how would I find an angle coterminal with that that's smaller? Subtract 360. Yeah, just subtract 360. So that's really the same as 270. And the coordinate for 270? Yeah, we just, I think we just did that one, right? 270, 0, negative 1, that was example 3. So C, example 3. Right? So sometimes that can happen as well. When you convert, you get an angle that's bigger than 360. Just subtract 360 to get it something more manageable. Um, what if you had an angle that was negative? What could you do? Add 360. Yeah, you could add 360. So what's that the same as? That's the same as 270. which is the same as this one, which is the same as example three. Okay, so all those problems would have the same answers. See example three. Okay, any questions on that one? All right. So the um, homework okay, on 324, okay, 56 to 61, 70 to 73. And then on 335, I want you to listen carefully. I want you to do what they're asking you to do, 1, 5, and 8. And on 1, 5, and 8, I want you to find the six trig functions as well. So I want you to find the sine, the cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, and cotangent of 1, 5, and 8. So do what they're asking in the book and find the six trig functions of 1, 5, and 8. And then I put a couple others to try as well. Find the six trig functions of 3 pi over 2, 2 pi, and square root 2 over 2, comma square root 2 over 2. To try or to do? To do. Okay. Yeah, do these. All right, so you got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 problems you have to find all six trig functions for. Okay, and whatever they ask you to do for 1, 5, 8 in the book, that, that part's pretty short. Okay, so we'll go over that um, first thing tomorrow. Okay, I will be after school today if anyone needs extra help. Um, and then we'll have our first test for term two.